-hmm. So what does it mean to present the gospel? And then I guess on a a higher level, why are you doing it? Hmm. Well, you were asking me earlier about, I'm not asking you, you were, you were suggesting we talk maybe about Colossians 1, is it 26? 24, I think. 24. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Where, and I think this is like segues into your question. Paul says that he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's one of those verses where you're like, hold up, Paul, that sounds kind of heretical. <laughs> uh, that's, that's where Christians are pressured to let Scripture interpret Scripture mm-hmm. and to, zo- to zoom in, zoom out, and zoom in again to Scripture. So we want to take the, the, the immediate context in, um, in consideration, zoom out to all of Scripture and let all of Scripture have its say, and zoom back into the passage. And I, I, I think this might be an, firstly an indirect answer and then a direct answer. Okay. Um, that passage, I think, is best explained. I think it's by it's Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. And I might have the reference wrong. But Paul is speaking about Epaphroditus, who was sent by those in Philippi to deliver a... a uh, did I get the, re- the reference right there? Philippians... Oh, I should read it out loud if I don't... Okay, Philippians... What did you say it was? Well, we were originally talking about Colossians one twenty four, where, right. where Paul mm-hmm. says... He's filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, and, and I promise I'm going somewhere here. And, I, and I, that's a difficult passage, but I think if we go to Philippians 2.30, uh, you want to read that one out loud? Uh, we're starting in 29. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in service to me. So the, the service uh, of Epaphroditus and the Philippians was a gift to Paul, if I understand the context correctly. He's in Rome, he's in mm-hmm. prison, and Epaphroditus risks his life to take the gift uh, from the believers who loved Paul uh, to Paul in prison. And uh, so you, he uses the same phrase, he, he completes or fulfills what it was lacking, same Greek construct. And it's really helpful because it's not that Epaphroditus is increasing the value of the gift right. uh, that, that, that's being delivered from the Philippians. What he's doing is he's presenting it. That's, this is where it's coming back around. Is What's lacking in the atonement, so to speak, in, uh, in Colossians 1.24, is not the merit or the effectiveness or the value of the atonement. It's a, it's a complete and definitive and accomplished atonement uh, but what's lacking in it is its externalized presentation. So God has, or he has designed in Paul's life, in particular, especially the apostolic life, but in the Christian life in general, he has designed suffering to be a means by which Christ's suffering is visualized or depicted to people. So by and with the word, we're, we're articulating, we're specifying, declaring the gospel in the lives of Christians are showing sacrificial love at cost, and it brings suffering. So it ends up being this sort of exhibition of the gospel, where Paul, for example, uh, he goes, he preaches, he goes on tour, so to speak, his missionary journeys, and he at times is stoned, and he is pummeled. And the bloody body of Paul ends up being a kind of reenactment or presentation of the gospel. It's like this sacrificial love that Paul is showing calls attention to the, the sufferings of Christ Jesus. And then, so that's not, that's not it's, it's not that what Paul presents in action is the gospel, it's that it kind of reflects and calls attention to the words by which Paul speaks the gospel. So sorry, I was, I was kind of like merging two no, topics. No, that's good. With, no, that's great. But a more direct answer is that we're called to be public and not private. We're not, we're not called to be idiosyncratic or, or like, oh, I've got this secret esoteric uh, I got this thing in the box here. Mm-hmm. You can't have it. The, the, the gospel is meant <laughs> to be publicly portrayed, publicly expressed, without cunning, without deceit, without tricks, with, without a worldly marketing in the end. I, the, gospel, the gospel is meant to be preached. How will they believe without a preacher? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, as, we're, as we're talking about this, some of us, we're like, man, I mean, I get what you're saying but it's scary. 
or um, what will people say about me? Or um, my family uh, will will absolutely uh, shun me, right? Mm-hmm. I will be excommunicated from my own family. Or uh, some of us, even if I think about my our brothers and sisters across in the, the, the closed countries where we mm-hmm. don't have even the freedom to speak the words of Jesus, uh, they will actually pay for it with their own lives. I mean, there's a lot at stake in some of these places. And in all of us, there's something at stake. So when you're saying that um, this is something where we can't hide it and we can't like, you know, keep it to ourselves, what do we do with this? What do we do? How do we navigate this? Um, um, is it wrong for us to be afraid and hide it? Is there are times when it's okay? I mean, this is some of us, this is very new territory. Mm. Well, there's a couple things there. One is there are occasions where Paul goes from one town to the other just for strategic reasons or providential reasons. Um, so maybe go somewhere where the gospels, is, there's more res- receptivity to it. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we don't, we don't intentionally walk into persecution. We're not, we're not asking for it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're not trying to be unwise. Jesus says to be as wise as serpent and as innocent as doves. Uh, he, he says to, uh, the, the New Testament says, Paul says to be, to live in peace with people as far as it depends on us. So we're not looking for friction we're not looking for belligerence. We don't want conflict. We don't want to quarrel. But we are called to be good witnesses. So we know this in our conscience too. Often, like this is this is an important time to to, to uh, speak up. We're called to love people by telling them the things that will most help them, and what will most honor God. So I, I, I would put it this way. I, I think that there's a way to do this with strangers, and there's a way to do this in relationship. Mm-hmm. And there's just just different context for this. I like to I like to do the stranger stuff, and if God permits, I'd love to do the, the relational stuff. I want to use the the opportunities that God has given me to share truth of the gospel, and sometimes that's just a gentle relational. It's like you're waiting for the right moment. Um, but I'm a, I'm a cognizant of the fact that you can make the excuses like I'll just wait another year, make another fight, <laughs> and it just gets more awkward. So, um, I. I think it's really important for Christians to think about cre- uh, trying to initiate and create opportunities and make it happen. Sometimes I like to use the uh, phrase punching through awkwardness uh, to to pierce through the fog. To sometimes, It's okay to be a little weird as a Christian. It's okay to be weird. It's okay to be uh, not slick. You're not, you're not car salesmen. Uh, great, great passages in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, Paul says, um, oh, let's see here. Flip, flip, flip. You hear the rustle of the pages. Um, Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. So he's tempted. You might be tempted to lose heart because they're, especially Paul and his apostolic band, they're under quite a bit of persecution. Mm -hmm. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by open statement of the truth, we would declare. We would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So the, the, the big idea there is that Paul is not resorting to a manipulation of or truncation of God's word, either in content or delivery. He is going straight for the conscience of people. He's not manipulating them. He's not trying to worm his way in. He's speaking with direct speech to the conscience and he's not watering down what he has to say. So this is a really good model. Paul is perhaps tempted to be uh, to lose heart. He's tempted to be um, uh, sly or cunning. Uh, I, this is why why in evangelism, I think it's just really important not to use methods that are underhanded or indirect. I, I if especially if you're doing stranger evangelism, just be direct. And if people don't want to talk. And if they don't want to talk about that, then that's okay. We'll just move on to the next person. But it, it, but it provides a really good model for me is that in ministry, I'm not called to be a car salesman. Mm. Um, sorry, car salesman. If I'm being, uh, <laughs> a good car salesman out there, I'm using this as a, yeah, you know what I mean. But um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not called to um, optimize for minimizing cringe among Gen Z. I'm not, I'm not to optimize for clicks mm-hmm. on social media. I'm not to optimize for maximizing the praise of man. Uh, I'm really here to give a clear presentation of the gospel uh, in word and deed, in relationship, 
or in direct conversation with strangers? Sorry if there wasn't a direct answer, but just, yeah. No, I, I love how we can just flesh these things out, and, and I don't even know if my question was that direct. So, it, it, <laughs> so it's great. But I think, too, in looking at this, again, friend, 2 Corinthians 4, and I just love it, having this ministry by the mercy of God. So this min- it's God's mercy that we are given this ministry, this ministry being that we are all commanded to go throughout the world and or to the world and, and preach the gospel, right? To share that, to give, to tell people uh, about, not just about Jesus, but their need for Jesus, right? And we all need a savior. And then it says, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. That's big, right? Mm. <laughs> Don't tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And, and what's fascinating about this is that that's exactly what Jesus did. Like when Jesus was, uh, uh, when he was subjected to that kangaroo court where they're saying, mm. hey, you know, and he's like, hey, I said everything out in the open. There Mm. is nothing that I said. I'm grossly paraphrasing here, by the way. Um, But he never said anything that was secret. And it was like always proclamation, proclamation. There were crowds of people. He spoke to all of them, small, big, big, important socially, Mm. the the, the smallest person. He he spoke to everybody the same. And and that is uh, what we should be doing. Mm. following right and 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 it's funny because paul throughout all of his ministry many in in many places in his letters he would say like imitate me as i imitate christ well this is a perfect example right christ Mm. did everything out in the open paul's doing everything in the open why aren't we Mm. and not to do things underhandedly so um you mentioned that a little bit and you mentioned the manipulation do you have an example of something that just gave you the willies, like you were just cringeworthy as you were as you were watching somebody try to, I don't know what they were trying to do, but try to share the gospel, but in a cringy way. Well, uh, I've heard the term stealth evangelism before. Okay, where you're starting conversations with people, and you, you just kind of you overdo the, the the trying to establish natural connections, and then you kind of you, you slide over into the gospel. Um, I don't, I'm not trying not to be harsh on my brothers here, but I, I think there's a kind of directness that I think would serve people's the dignity of the direct communication there. I think is better. Let me think of a better example. Um, I don't. I, I'll be a little controversial here. Okay. I don't like tracks that trick people. I don't like tracks that um, like the money one. That yeah, you that you put under like for a tip, and then you're like, oh, it's like a hundred dollar. That bill. is an excellent example. Because <laughs> well, I fell for that. The, 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 so I, I I don't want to be too harsh, and I don't want to be too judgmental. I'll, I'll think about the worst example of that. It would okay. be like a fo- what looks like a folded up uh, bill mm-hmm. is left at a, uh, a waitress table, right, or a table at a restaurant, and and people are, people are drawn to it, and then they, oh, it's got the gospel on it, right? I I I don't think that is fitting for the kinds of mode of communication that we should be a part of. I, I think I, I want to be really gentle with my brothers because they're, they're like desperate. They want to start gospel conversations. They want to do anything they can do to draw a crowd or draw a person. And I'm like, well, I just don't think that's best for conscience. And I, I think that kind of frustrates people. Uh, let's just be ov- overt about it. And let, let, we don't need to trick people. Um, for, you know, it, 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 a church is advertising, trying to get people to pull in. I mean, we should just be clear about our agenda. We have a very clear agenda. We want to we want to draw you in to hear the gospel. We want we want to, for you to hear the preaching of the word. We want you to experience, as a visitor, the the worship of the great Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so yeah, we might have a class here on finances. We might have a class here on parenting. Um, and and but we want to be clear. Mm-hmm. Like uh, our ultimate agenda is that this would all be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So. So just so you know, uh, our cards are on the table. We're not trying to trick you into something here. So if you want to come and and and, and benefit from the parenting class or the financial class, peace university, whatever, great. But uh, you just you know just the whole thing. We just need to be clear. We're we're not here to to socially engineer people into the kingdom of God. We need to respect the dignity of direct communication. I think too by 
by doing a bait and switch is basically kind of mm-hmm. sometimes right um and and again i don't want to be critical because um you know what there's just so many ministries out there that i'm just like god uses them mm-hmm. god uses us like if 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 you find yourself like oh wait i think i've done that many times and you're feeling a little bit uh, but god uses that i mean he'll use whatever we offer right even in our mess right he's he's always he's transforming us as well and he is we we don't do things well the first time, right? We mm. just get in there and do the stuff and, and pray to the Lord and ask Him um, to, to just help us out. But I think by doing things like that, we we kind of like don't trust God, mm. right? We, we're not, we're, we're saying, you know what, Lord, um, if, if I didn't do this little bait and switch thing, I don't know if the Holy Spirit would actually do anything. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know yeah. if we come out and say that, right? But yeah, we, we treat it like... Um like some sort of like spiritual pyramid scheme. Like you go out and you get uh, 15 converts and then they go out and they get 15 more. Or or like we're, we're trying to sell like some sort of heavenly timeshare where it's like, oh, thank you very much for coming. Would you like a, a, a place in heaven? And it, it's like, that's <laughs> that's not what's going on here. Like, like you said earlier, Aaron, it, it, it's, this is about humanity's rebellion against the creator of the universe. Mm. The, don't, don't bury the lead there. Don't, don't downplay it. Don't uh, degrade it to the point of like making it a, a sales pitch. Mm. The, this is, this is the, the meaning of, of life and existence of the universe. Yeah. Why, why would we muddy those waters with like, oh, it's a lovely weather. By the way, if you were to die today, it, it, it's, it's like, uh, uh, why, why are we... Uh, I, I'm I'm with you on that. Where where it should be more direct, you know this this is the most important conversation you could have with someone. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, being very sober minded and serious and solemn and, and straightforward on the street, and uh, using the language of warning about uh, uh, the message of the gospel. And a Muslim man, a young Muslim man, stopped. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here, and uh, and. The group he was with just kept going, mm-hmm. and he stopped, turned around, and said, okay, tell me what you want to say. And oh. I, I asked him, why, why did you stop? And he said, I'm refre- re- refreshing my memory here, he said something to the effect of, well, my father taught me that when a man is willing to be um, pointed mm-hmm. and sober-minded, and when he gives a very solemn warning that it's at least worth listening to. There's a wisdom in slowing or pausing to hear what someone has to say. If someone's willing to to uh, to to break through the fog, if, if someone's if someone <clears throat> isn't trying to to appeal to my flesh essentially or tickle me mm-hmm. or itch my my scratch scratch my itches, uh, then I, maybe what they have to say is actually really important. It, it's at least worth a listen. And I, I was like, that was really that was that was really a, wise. That was really wise. I, wow, <laughs> you know, sometimes someone. Who has something important to say? Um, looks like John the Baptist. They have an Elijah costume on, and they're eating bugs. And uh, <laughs> with honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes God sends a Jeremiah or an Ezekiel, mm-hmm. and uh, it just doesn't. Or some, sometimes God sends a Paul, who perhaps was bow-legged. Uh, he has all these marks on his back, beaten to a pulp. And uh, man, when he shows up, he doesn't get a good reception. Someone might say, you know, by the pattern of, of sort of the common way that you, you, uh, you get kicked out of town after town after town after town, Paul, you must be doing something wrong here. Mm-hmm. God's idea of marketing the cross is very against human wisdom. He loves to go into a town through his apostles and save a bunch of poor people who are rich in faith, a bunch of ragtag uh, former uh, slaves, homosexuals, thieves, uh, and, and, he, and he, he saves them, and they're not necessarily of high stature. He doesn't draw them in with great marketing or high social status. And what he does is he rebukes the wisdom of the world by having his people preach the foolishness of the gospel. And then he, he says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when men revile you, slander you, persecute you on my account. That's what they did to the prophets of old. And wow, we should say bless. We should think of ourselves as blessed because we're following suit. We're following the great tradition. Uh, the, the, the evangelistic strategy for Paul was to go into a town 
and overtly preach the gospel, even in synagogues, <laughs> and then perhaps to be, uh, so he's not, he's not trying to be persecuted, but by God's design, the, the evangelistic strategy here, so to speak, was that he would overtly preach the gospel and then suffer, and through the sufferings would, as it were, fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, uh, Colossians 1.24. In other words, God used the suffering that followed faithful preaching to more clearly uh, present the sufferings of Christ analogically or, or by analogy through his servants. Mm -hmm. So earlier this week, we we're kind of talking about that one guy who wore the Jesus Saves t-shirt in the Mall of America in Minnesota, right? And uh, he got kicked out <laughs> because <laughs> because they're like, you're proselytizing and, um, and not only you're... you're it was basically selling things. Mm. And, and you know, when you think about it, you're not selling anything. We got to get over that used car salesman kind of joke there because we're not selling nothing. Okay. In fact, everything is given. It is given away. Uh, you don't, the only thing that you're buying into, if you will, is the fact that you, there are things that you already know about yourself, right? Like buying into the fact that Oh, yeah, I am a sinner. Um, I am not perfect. Uh, and, and then buying into the fact, quote unquote, buying in that God is all holy. He is omniscient. He is uh, omnipotent, so all powerful, all knowing and holy, so other than us. And that if we were confronted by the Lord today and he says today is the day that you are going to die. Right. Will you go to heaven? And, and then you had to ask yourself that most of us are going to say, oh, no, mm. no. I, if it's by my righteousness, even if I have the most self-righteousness as the next person, I can never meet the righteousness of God. Then what God says is, OK. I took your sin and I give you my righteousness as his righteousness is the only thing that's going to ever get you to be with him in relationship with him and sweet relationship with him forever. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so it's not, a t it's not a selling somebody something. You are, you are essentially saying, I know somebody who's going to give you eternal life. How is that selling? And we got to get over, if you are a person who maybe that's how you've approached all this evangelism thing, maybe we need to retool our thinking a little bit on that because God is so glorious and so good and so more merciful so gracious, so uh, generous, and so loving, and so just that we can't help but proclaim him. Uh, we have to proclaim him. Aaron, do you have any stats on how many people are actually, I'm talking about Christians and born-again evangelical churches, are actually active in witnessing? Is there... I don't have stats. Okay. No. I, I'm guessing it's a pretty small number. Yeah, uh, maybe 10% or something of mm. people that are actually active in sharing their faith. Our problem isn't maybe a bad approach. Our problem is there's no approach. Mm. Mm. There's nothing. We're not active. We're not doing it. And we've had conversations in the past about, we're not trying to put guilt on you either. That's not what this is about. No. Mm. But we've been given a great message that we're, we're, we're supposed to be sharing, that we have the privilege of sharing. Why aren't we doing it? Mm -hmm. And what are some of the major obstacles you find when talking with people? Because your, your ministry is e evangelism, so mm. you're, you're equipping the saints for ministry according to Ephesians 4, 12, and that's your job. Equip us. Well, um, I like to empower believers with some really simple questions to use. I, I have found that there is a segment of Christians who are eager to share their faith, but they just need a little bit of training. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me... The Ray Comfort stuff, I'm not sure. If you wanted to Google Way of the Master by Ray Comfort, he has a really simple, you could say formulaic way of just thinking about sharing the gospel where he'll, he'll do something like uh, ask someone, uh, have you ever told a lie before? Yes, I have told a lie before. How many lies do you think you've told? Countless. Ballpark it. Yeah. <laughs> 10,000? What do you call someone who tells that many lies? A liar. And so he'll walk through some of the Ten Commandments and he'll end with, uh, well, that, that makes you a lying, thieving, adulterer. What? You, watch it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a helpful. And then what he does is he segues to the cross, and he it, so it ends up just being a really kind of repeatable way to share the gospel with a stranger or anybody. And you could take it as a template and run with it. So I think some Christians they just need to see it. Uh, so I, I would be careful on YouTube because sometimes evangelism can be depicted as very dramatic or very you have something very charismatic. Uh, but really, evangelism is 99% of the time much less interesting than that. It looks very boring to the world. So it's a much more slow, 
um, sort of just boring conversation to the world's eyes. Um, but just be careful. But you, if you look on YouTube, you will find some neat examples of believers um, interacting, Ray Comfort style maybe. Another thing I, I would say is we have been told that we need to find a way that's natural to share the gospel, where we can uh, circumvent the awkwardness of it. And I think the most empowering thing I could say to my brothers and sisters in Christ is that you should swallow the awkwardness, uh, punch through the awkwardness because you love Jesus and you love your neighbor. Probably better to take the risk mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and learn uh, by trial and uh, fail and, and see where God matures you in that. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is fantastic. And, and friend, we, we love telling the gospel to the world because, again, it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes it. The gospel is just, and that's how we live our lives as Christians, too. Uh, we, um, let's see here. Um, my, our friend Tracy does, and we, Tracy, we don't have enough time to talk about this right now, but she says, I noticed that it is easier to share Jesus when there is a relationship, but if you are on the street corner, it's not going to happen. Is there an in-between? I would say there's a, there's a relationship between stranger evangelism and relational evangelism. One helps you be more tender with the other. One helps you be more bold with the other. I would mm -hmm. say do both. They're very different. I, I think they're very different. The in-between, yeah, it, it, there's there. But um, one requires more. They, they, they both require a different kind of boldness and mm -hmm. courage. Uh, and one person, I remember going out to eat with him, and we were just sitting down. Um, we took our order, and our order came, and then he, before we ate, he looked at the waitress, and he said, hey, we're going to pray right now. Is there anything we could pray for mm. you about? And maybe that's just the way to open a conversation. Mm. You would never know. Just keep planting seeds everywhere, and the, let the Lord let the Lord work the way he does, but if, be if that have, agency. If you have some quirky people in your church that are kind of goofy even, or just, just they, make, they make you cringe because of the way they get evangelistic, Maybe just learn from them and imitate them a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and always go before the Lord in prayer. Aaron, our time went so fast. This is so great. Yeah. We're going to have you back because there's just so much more we need to learn from you. So thank you so much for spending time with Appreciate us. It. Dear friend, thank you as well. Go out and preach the good word. Do not hide your light under a bushel. No.